A warm welcome to our 111th uh, webinar of the series Europe Calling. It's an interesting figure, 111, because, uh, uh, but the topic is very serious. Uh, what about climate policy in times of rising energy policies? Market instruments are so central uh, for uh, the energy transition, climate protection, uh, but uh, they will be politically difficult uh, to impose if at the same time um, people are burdened by high energy prices. That's why we came to, go to, go to go uh, came together with Jutta Paulus and uh, Michael Bloss. Uh, we are responsible in the European Parliament for this issue. My name is Sven Giegold, and we invited Professor Ottmar Edenhofer, who is a um, well-known climate uh, economist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's going to uh, give us a presentation about which we're going to discuss afterwards. Uh, as always, uh, in this Europe Calling webinars, we want to get uh, European citizens in touch uh, with uh, European uh, politics, uh, with decisions, and with the people who have an influence on them. And after the Climate Conference of Glasgow, it's important that we do something for the success of the Green Deal, but also for the construction of a political coalition in Germany, which uh, can bring us uh, forward as to the question. So it will be interesting what we are going to hear today. And uh, you can all also ask questions. We have an F and an, an Q and A uh, button into which you can post your questions and answers. Uh, but you can also read what other participants wrote. And we need uh, your feedback. But normally, we get a lot of feedback too much for taking it up here. Because during this webinar, we had 3,000 registrations for this uh, webinar. Most of uh, you are locked in now. And this will mean that means that we will also get a lot of questions. We are going to speak about the most important questions and put them to Professor Edenhofer. So do read what others uh, wrote as questions and liked them if you like them. And uh, those who got the most likes uh, will be those we will pick up and put to Professor Edenhofer. As always, our webinars are public. If something um, interesting is said, uh, or heard, then you can post it in the social media, can tell it friends, uh, so that these contents reach even more people. And uh, you can also de disseminate that uh, we have now this webinar, um, that we have started the webinar with this tweet I've just uh, sent you. You can forward it to your friends, because we want to reach as many people as uh, possible with these important contents. That's why we also record these webinars in German and in English. and. Uh, via the videos which can be looked um, which can be um, watched later we will reach even more people we hope and you can also tell your friends about it as i said but that's enough um, uh, thank you very much thank you very much professor edenhofer that you found the time to come here tonight and spend the evening with us and tell us something about uh, the relationship between increased uh, energy prices and a successful climate policy uh, Professor Edenhofer, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, very glad that I can be with you tonight. And I'll have to try to share my screen with you. Can you see uh, the um, slides and can you also hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, perfect. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, the topic is difficult, I think. Uh, climate uh, policy in the energy price gap. And this is a very difficult uh, topic because uh, you might uh, suppose that uh, we are in a dilemma here where we have trade-offs on both sides. But if you look at what uh, has been happening lately, you see uh, that the Glantz Coal Price Index and the gas price have risen. And as soon as they rose, uh, there were reactions on the CO2 market, on the carbon market, and in Europe, uh, people discussed whether we should, in whether they should intervene into the markets, uh, whether margin costs, uh, um, tariffs uh, on the electricity market uh, are uh, a good thing, or whether people had to intervene. That's the basis for our discussion. And the question is, uh, how should we describe this alleged energy price uh, dilemma? I would say uh, 
uh, four points are important in this respect. This alleged dilemma uh, says that rising energy prices lead to economic and social fault lines. Additionally, climate policies and as an indicator for climate indicators, I take CO2 prices also lead to rising energy prices and exacerbate uh, thus, uh, these fault lines. And instead of saying CO2 prices, you could say technology, technology standards, but all this would lead to higher prices and would then be under suspicion to increase this dilemma. But in practice, it's... Uh, a fact uh, that if energy prices are low and uh, the economy grows, the time for the introduction of carbon pricing is not uh, ideal because then you have the risk uh, that uh, you stifle the recovery. So in other words, there is no good uh, time for introducing CO2 prices or uh, to have a good climate policy. This is this alleged ener energy price dilemma we hear about. And this means that there will always be reasons for remaining in the same equilibrium in which we are at the moment, at the same in the same status quo, and that we don't dare, or at least are very reluctant, uh, to uh, strive for this new balance. The question is, how can we solve this dilemma? And in this respect, I would like to argue that in a static perspective, the dilemma may be plausible, but if you look at it dynamically, it looks differently. Because if you look at it dynamically, fa the fact is that through the carbon price and other climate political measures, um, investments are guided towards CO2 free alternatives. And this will lead to innovations, and these innovations will then lead themselves to a more efficient energy and land use system, because part of the climate policy is the transformation of uh, the energy system, but also of the land use system. And that's what I mean when I say that we would thus uh, get a more efficient energy and land use system, would reach a new equilibrium. And with this, I want to say that on the one hand, uh, the costs of the national economy of the system are lower because it's sustainable, because uh, it uh, sets a price for the costs of climate change, because there is less local atmospheric pollution, uh, air pollution, and uh, for the society in times of climate change, it's definitely the better system. And this dynamic perspective uh, is a further aspect which is important for our arguments. And uh, this means that we need a carbon price. It's indispensable uh, because the CO2 price uh, would signal the new relevant scarcities. Uh, transitionally for a certain time, high fossil energy prices will have to need, will need um, accompany measures, social accompany measures uh, in order to avoid social and economic hardships. That's also a fact. But my argument would be that what I've described, uh, the CO2 pricing would be the most effective means of climate policy uh, accompanied by other measures, and that we also need climate pricing beyond uh, 2050. And here you see the structure of my speak. The first point would be, why is uh, carbon pricing necessary? Basically, it has uh, four functions. First of all, it uh, makes the fossil energy sources more expensive and thus reduces emissions. Secondly, it increases the profitability of carbon-free alternatives and is thus a driver for green innovation. Uh, it uh, generates uh, income, which can then be used for a fair distribution of the costs of the measures. And the fourth effect, very, very important, is that it's a yardstick for the seriousness of climate policies. And uh, I'd like to uh, say a bit more on this. If uh, the CO2 price is my centerpiece, I don't want to say with it that the CO2 price is the sole instrument we should use. There are other tools of climate policy, like, for example, technology standards, subsidies, soft law recommend, um, recommendations or bans. Uh, and CO2 price is in a world which is no, where there is no uncertainty and uh, burdens are equally shared. All these uh, objectives would lead to our goal. But supposing that uh, we have uh, 
full information on everything, that there are no uncertainties, well, that's a very heroic uh, supposition. But if you go beyond that, you will notice that all these instruments have their advantages, but I would basically argue that they need as a complement CO2 pricing in order to lead to the goal we want to have, uh, we want to reach with climate policy, i.e. reducing of emissions in a cost efficient and fair way. Uh, technology standards, for example, is important, uh, an important point uh, in the transport sectors, but sector, but if, if you increase uh, technology standards, uh, things will become efficient, but also heavier. And this means that emissions can rise nevertheless. Subsidies, for example, if you subsidize uh, electrical and uh, electric cars, uh, you push more alternatives to the markets, to the market, but the old um, car fleet uh, remains on the market. So you have to find ways uh, to renew the old car fleet. Uh, then uh, soft law or bans uh, for certain uh, combustion techniques. Uh, if you say uh, we are not going to authorize um, combustion motor engines anymore, well, this is something you could do, but you would have to supplement it so that with uh, CO2 prices, th so that emissions really go back and uh, here an example for uh, to illustrate this uh, carbon pricing um, uh, in the electricity sector. Uh, a new paper was published in this respect uh, in one of the most um, relevant uh, technical journal. We have here uh, scenarios. Uh, a small climate policy, econometrics, uh, call it a synthetic baseline, I, a, a, a construed baseline. And uh, in this, you see uh, how far emissions go back in real terms. And you can see here that after 2013, when the UK introduced uh, uh, so-called uh, carbon price support, emissions went down uh, considerably. 26% uh, uh, per year between 2013 and 2017. This is what we would expect in theory, but it also means that we can now um, uh, prove it um, empirically. The same in the transport sector. My colleague Niklas Koch um, established a study here and he tried to show that in all the countries you see mentioned here where the emissions in the traffic sector uh, went down, uh, he tried to find out why. Uh, thanks to which tools they went down. And he had not only a look at uh, carbon prices, but at all the instruments and has tried to um, find out with the algorithm uh, of his uh, computer um, uh, what was relevant. And he found out that uh, where emissions in transport went back, several tools had been combined, uh, CO2 prices, uh, or uh, taxes on um, uh, petrol or uh, um, road tolls. Newer um, analysis, which I'm not going to explain in detail here, uh, show uh, why CO2 prices, uh, that CO2 prices also led to more green patterns. So carbon pricing has also an effect uh, as to long-term innovation. So far, so good. This is what uh, normally uh, is to be expected uh, um, based on economic theory and uh, where there is uh, evidence in economic theory. But it's still true that carbon prices in general and climate policy in particular uh, are a um, business cycle problem, which can be very explosive uh, socially. And, uh, in, and in the end of the day, um, it this might also be connected to problems with competition, with, sorry, with competitiveness. So it's important to have a look at uh, what we have uh, as a plan uh, for climate neutrality in Europe. I take Europe here as a Paris pro toto. I could also sh show uh, such a graph for Germany, but I chose the European perspective here. And in the European perspective, you see that until 2050, as to uh, emissions, we want to reach the net zero. And this means that uh, basically in all sectors, uh, we are going uh, to trigger a, a structural change, uh, which um, is unheard of. 
in electricity and all the other sectors, industrial process emissions, well, we would not be able to avoid them all. That's why we'll need uh, CO2 remo removal technologies. Without such technologies, we will not manage to reach climate neutrality. And uh, uh, one has to understand what they can achieve, these technologies. Uh, they allow that, uh, well, people say, some people say they allow us to take more time uh, for um, our uh, adaption for our um, other measures, but that's not true. They're just a supplement. So this is the, obje the objective we have. And we also try to find out with which uh, CO2 prices um, or which CO2 prices we have to expect if you, we don't use further instruments. Here you see different points in time, 2025, 2030, 2035. And uh, we um, carried out our calculations. You see it's quite uncertain. Uh, and uh, this is because uh, we had uh, different assumptions uh, as to these innovations. Uh, as to um, the market introduction of hydrogen, synthetic uh, fuels, but also as to, to infrastructure enhancements and so on and so forth. And you see um, when uh, te such technologies are introduced into the market successfully, the costs go down. We computed this for three scenarios. Uh, we see the we said, uh, especially in the electricity sector and in the industry, we have to look at such uh, scenarios and then a division of labor, um, uh, electricity and industry on the one hand, and um, buildings and uh, transport on the other side. You see costs go down a little here, and then the division of labor between the sectors in the Fit for 55 uh, proposal of the European Commission. And you see that uh, these are quite considerable uh, avoidance costs, uh, um, and we may reach 200 euros, uh, which is not excessive, but it still means that uh, we will have uh, to consider uh, considerable costs in the future. And here the question is also, how are we going to manage this? Uh, clever people made their calculations uh, on this. And here I would like to um, make one argument mainly. The more uh, such uh, CO2 prices are introduced as a shock, the less they uh, can be expected by investors and consumers, the more they will lead to economic and social fault lines. That's the first important thing we have to consider. There will be more. And what is also clear here, um, here um, an important uh, analysis, which was uh, uh, presented a few weeks ago. Uh, this is that uh, low income uh, households spend a higher share of their income for a CO2 in intensive goods. And this means that uh, CO2 uh, policies hit mainly poorer households. But there is an indirect effect too, because uh, not the sectors with a high emission intensity are those who are hardest hit, but the service sector in which uh, mainly people with a low income work. And this means that this issue can be quite explosive socially. And the more as a shock such CO2 prices are introduced, the more they lead to emissions going down, but they could also uh, lead to higher, higher unemployment. But the important thing, the crucial thing here is that uh, uh, you see clearly that introducing such uh, prices as a shock will lead to pretty large uh, fault lines. So socially, uh, if you announce them in time, long in advance, uh, the fault lines they cause will be lower. So climate policy has to be long term, has to be credible, and it needs also a long time horizon. Uh, the longer uh, the, the consumers and uh, the companies uh, can uh, expect these the longer in advance, the longer they can take them into account in their investment decisions, uh, the more um, consumers can look for alternatives on the market, the smaller will be the social problems. Indeed, and I've already hinted at this earlier, and I would like to show it again. 
especially uh, CO2 prices have a regressive effect, which means that they are disproportionately uh, have a stronger effect on uh, lower income households. So the 20% of the poorest uh, households will uh, share a higher burden than the 20% uh, richest households. But when you then look at the income from uh, CO2 prices, the and you just uh, reimburse per capita, then that would mean that a poorest household would actually have a net benefit and that would really relieve uh, the burden on them. And in between that, there is a number of different um, variations, but these are the two options broadly. And then there are other possible um, measures, for instance, energy uh, standards in transport and compare, compared to a compensated CO2 price, the disadvantages of this uh, model would be higher because poorer households um, drive uh, smaller cars, but uh, the costs of the transport standards will um, hit them harder. The richest uh, quintile actually have a 3.5 times the income of the poorest quintile, but they only uh, use 1% less um, petrol per, per kilometer and also the uh, richest uh, drive longer distances. So the energy efficiency of cars won't help a poorest uh, as much. So in terms of uh, distributive uh, policy, uh, the costs are higher and the income generated won't be as high in order to uh, lighten the burden for poorer households. And then uh, um, uh, lump sum per capita reimbursement, I've already mentioned that, then possible indexing of social transfer to the development of gas and oil prices, hardship funds. But the important thing is that these compensations have to be visible and they have to be credible in order to have a political impact. And at least as important, just to uh, talk about this quickly, is uh, to make sure that we have international cooperation because main emitters have to cooperate, have to go into the same direction. So um, climate gas neutrality by 2050, that's the only way to ensure a level playing field and uh, global emission reduction. It's the only way to achieve this in order to achieve these goals. And now, luckily, the US and the EU have similar objectives, and at least China has started uh, talking about to uh, achieve climate gas neutrality by 2060. So let's talk about uh, emissions trading at the European level. I believe that it, it is important to uh, work with two different systems and I know that the second emissions trading system is uh, sensitive in political terms, and I know that uh, some of my colleagues in this uh, panel won't be as much of a fan of the second system for transport and buildings, but at least there's a discussion about it. And we have to think about it, because if we don't introduce that second trade, how are we going to achieve our very ambitious goals in the, these sectors, transport and buildings? So I think while introducing Thing, the second system, ETS system, we will have a clear perspective and send a CO2 signal for these two sectors. And that will then lead to uh, a perspective to um, then go on to an integrated, one integrated uh, ETS uh, after 2030. In this integrated system, prices could then also uh, actually lower and that would ease the burden. So uh, we'd be working with a price corridor in order to have a stable, stable expectations. And that is important in order to avoid shocks um, in climate policy, shocks uh, because of the introduction of CO2 prices, if they're too sudden, that would, um, as I said, stabilize expectations long-term and potential social upheaval, economic upheaval could be avoided or cushioned. I showed you this slide earlier on about uh, gas and coal price development. And um, this has had a very specific impact on electricity markets and emissions, because I actually showed uh, 
that at least for a time, um, electricity to um, coal to electricity has increased because we had a lower renewable uh, and a higher demand for electricity and gas prices increased quite a bit. And some even feared that uh, we would just go back from gas to coal because of that price increase. But I think the this effect will be temporary because we do have a CO2 price. True, the past uh, few weeks, the gas price was higher than the CO2 price. So coal-powered uh, plants uh, partially driving gas uh, plants out of the market, but because the emissions, the upper emissions limit is coupled to the, this price, this is not going to be a long-term effect. So it means that we have a CO2 price. It's important to have CO2 prices and emissions trading because free price formation on the CO2 market allows immediate reaction to international fuel price development. So if in the long term, the gas prices increase faster than the coal prices, then uh, it would not be possible to stop uh, rebirth, you know, going back to coal without this compensating CO2 price. And we would like to avoid this effect. Relative prices for fossil energy sources do play a decisive role here because it's impossible to keep up with the review of tax rates, technological standards and subsidies uh, because prices um, develop much faster than laws. And so that means we really urgently need mechanisms in order which mechanisms which are still effective even when gas prices increase faster than coal prices. And the um, burden of a CO2 price will be anti-cyclical anti in emissions trading. So <clears throat> demands for fossil fuels will lower and, in, and during that time, the CO2 price will also be <clears throat> lower. And in better economic times, the CO2 price will also increase. And this will help in terms of social and economic upheavals in line with the economic cycles. I'm almost at the end of my presentation now. <clears throat> I would just like to mention why we are going to still need these CO2 prices even after 2050. Uh, let's um, talk about these two graphs. <clears throat> The CO2 price level, let's say 300 euros per ton of CO2, does not necessarily mean that the costs on the economy will be high, the total economy. So 300 euros per ton of CO2 in buildings and uh, transport, that's realistic. But why would the total cost not be as high? Because we have a uh, low hanging fruit that we can harvest a lot of that so that's why this is relatively moderate and then on the right hand side we have the 200 euro um, per ton co2 the total costs are much higher because you don't have these low hanging fruit so we are going to uh, live in a world with relatively uh, high marginal abatement costs mac and high uh, co2 costs irrespective of the whether other accompanying measures will be adopted to the CO2 price or not, but we'll have one or two percent um, um, abatement costs as accumulated share of the uh, GDP because of the low hanging fruit that we can harvest. And then let's uh, move on to the next slide. Now, the problem is that uh, many politicians say which the high CO2 prices cannot be implemented politically. Um, it's not possible. <clears throat> may, they may be right, but there's a price if you don't do it because we have this traditional uh, climate policy and emissions trading where we only work with a politically acceptable, acceptable, feasible CO2 prices. And then there is a different area of this of the new climate policy on the right of this graph. So we all know if we want to come to a greenhouse gas neutrality, we need hydrogen, synthetic fuels and negative emissions. But, and this is uh, how the argument goes, 
you can't uh, get there with CO2 prices. You need something new. Industrial politics, public investment and subsidies. <clears throat> And I would like to continue on with this uh, question, but just one thing <clears throat> as an aside, this is the core debate between those on the one hand who believe that we need something different in the future, different um, political instruments than the CO2 price, because they believe that this type of long-term dependable, expectable rising CO2 prices is not something that politicians can commit to. This is not a technical argument. It's a, <clears throat> it's a viewpoint of what would be possible in a democratic system and a democratic politics. Um, but it's also important to say that the other instruments, uh, the other tools, subsidies, public investment, uh, technological um, standards for this uh, area where the MAC are going to um, increase are also costs that won't disappear. But let me <clears throat> also um, put forward another argument. There's always a grain of truth in um, the political arguments and uh, Let's have one more slightly more technical slide before I uh, get to the um, end of my presentation. When we think about climate policy, we think about the energy system. So I just uh, chose the electricity market as an example here. So we have direct <coughs> electrification for vehicles, passenger cars, hydrogen, indirect electrification, and of course the major uh, area of e fuels, synthesized uh, fuels. Now, what's important is that when you, if you want to generate these e-fuels in a greenhouse gas neutral way, you're going to need either biomass, which we probably won't have, or we need atmospheric CO2 directly um, taken from the atmosphere uh, using carbon dioxide removal technologies. So if you look at this, we, when we can't use fossil CO2 because if we do that, then the synthesized fuels won't be greenhouse gas neutral. But that means that very uh, complex um, value added chains are um, triggered. So we have to look at the global indus industrial uh, carbon cycle. We will be a part of that. And you have to uh, keep an eye on all the element parts of the chain. So I think it's going to be very difficult to implement all of this with uh, bans and uh, obligations. We will need CO2 pricing for it. And so what's the grain of truth here that I mentioned? That uh, synthesized fuels, in order to be profitable with uh, natural gas, would need a 550 euros CO2 price in order to make it worth to switch to hydrogen from natural gas. So that's for the next few years. But we will also get technological progress. And because of that progress, then synthesized fuels will become cheaper. And then if step by step we have the CO2 prices, then that means that the synthesized fuels have a chance on the market up to that uh, point in time, we will need to finance pilot projects, we'll need uh, subsidies uh, for a certain amount of time, we'll need uh, tech, uh, support for technologies, but these very complex value added chains will only work if the subsidies come with a sunset clause, with an endpoint, because you do want to um, replace that step by step with CO2 pricing. and. Uh, I could show you, I um, showed you the same thing with the example of kerosene on the left hand side. And you can um, finance this with uh, public investment, contracts for difference, upfront investment costs, maybe even immediate tax write offs. But if you don't use CO2 prices uh, on the markets, um, then these long term investments will go, won't go in the right directions. And even for the negative emissions, we will need high CO2 prices beyond 2050. And this green uh, line shows you that uh, they're not always going to increase further. They're just going to stay at a high level because we need to avoid any incentives to continue using fossil fuels.
So this is going to be necessary in order to a be able to finance negative emissions, but also be able to keep investors from using um, synthetic fuels um, or generating them with fossil uh, um, fuels, fossil energy sources. So this brings me to my last uh, slide. Um, my summary. CO2 prices are necessary. They may be um, complemented by other tools but cannot be replaced by anything. They shouldn't and mustn't lead to social economic upheaval and to um, a permanent uh, distortion of competition. Uh, that's the political task. So we need a European level emissions trading system. I think that could be a good way to achieve it. And uh, greenhouse gas neutrality doesn't have, doesn't cost the world. It's not going to be that expensive that it's not affordable, but uh, the CO2 price is necessary to achieve it. They may not be impossible, but they are uh, politically uh, painful. So the question is what um, can politics achieve and what can politicians achieve and how can they um, have credible expectations? And then we will need, uh, we will have social tensions because of rising energy prices and we need accompanying uh, transitional measures um, in order to cushion the introduction, but that's not a reason to delay or even prevent the introduction of CO2 prices. And I think that is the main task for the next decade for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Edenhofer. That was a very interesting um, shedding light on all these complex issues around CO2 pricing and prices and how that is uh, the main tool for climate policy or could be the main tool. And uh, I think uh, today is uh, uh, an important day because the European CO2 price for the first time reached uh, 70 euros. And I think three years ago, we could only dream of this. And as the Green Party, we've always said 60 euros CO2 price, uh, that will be the, uh, the phasing out of coal. And we never expected to get there in 2021. We thought it would be 2027 and uh, with more renewables. But um, these prices are definitely um, going to lead to changes, um, impressive. And at the same time, one of the first battle cries of the climate movement and Fridays of Future movement was that the CO2, CO2 emissions have to cost, have to bear the same cost as the cost of what it destroys. So 180, 195 euros, that's what it costs. Um, uh, society so that should be the price for one a ton of co2 should uh, that should be the minimum level for a co2 price and at the same time i thought it was uh, very interesting uh, when you said the and you explained how uh, co2 prices work on innovation investment the effect the prices have the prices have and how that can lead to uh, energy efficiency and new technologies and of course uh, for us the question is for us because we're negotiating this at the moment at the european level and i am uh, responsible for my group for uh, european emissions trading and we're talking about exactly this question among other things uh, what should the co2 price be where should it be used at the moment it's just energy and industry and now there's this proposal to expand it to buildings and transport so how can we uh, at a european level implement um, these prices, legitimate them, um, make, what does it mean for consumers? Frage für mich, wer bezahlt den Preis? Also was ist eigentlich die Verteilungswirkung? Um, so what is the distributional effect of a carbon price? This is something you mentioned, I believe, that the price alone uh, has a, a rather regressive distributional effect which means that low-income uh, households will be harder hit 
than um, families with a higher income. And this cannot be our policy as Greens. We want a progressive system so that those who can share a heavier burden get a heavier burden. The art is how can we do this politically? And that's why what you said is extremely important. You said uh, energy compensation uh, might be an idea. Uh, for those uh, who have uh, to afford it, uh, such uh, energy compensations uh, should be paid out visibly and credibly, and not in a way that people don't even realize that they get uh, this uh, support. So um, the question is also, uh, how do we announce or publicize um, carbon prices publicly uh, can people understand that uh, it's also it's it's really important for climate protection and that there is also money uh, that reaches them to support them another important uh, debate is the following uh, we discuss um, this uh, issue of co2 pricing in industry and in the energy sector, where it works quite well, CO2 emissions go down. In the industrial sector, well, the prices would have to be a little bit higher to really um, uh, have it uh, have a, an effective system. So maybe we need more incentives here. And in transport and in the heating sector, uh, it would have a direct uh, impact uh, uh, for the citizens. And so the question is, could we establish such a system for um, the whole of Europe? Because available income in Denmark for most people is different from what it is in, say, Bulgaria or in Berlin and uh, Stuttgart or Brussels. Uh, Mm, uh, well, if you have they're the same carbon market, uh, then they have it in Bucharest and Athens. Um, this means that we have to think in a European way how we can compensate uh, for these differences. Or if you look at it uh, uh, from the other side, we also need CO2 prices who are effective. Uh, they have to be to have an effect uh, on climate policies. Um, CO2 has uh, to go down thanks to these uh, prices. And this is the dilemma in which we are. And the solution is not easy. And we uh, think that a stronger regulatory um, policy um, is what we need, which has to be paid for. Uh, so regulatory policy, um, how can we uh, bring about more investment in the, the sense uh, by uh, companies uh, which uh, for which these rules then um, are applied? So we have a lot of things to discuss about today, and I pass the floor to Jutta Paulus, uh, uh, the Green Speaker for Energy Policy. But before I do this, I would... Uh, point out that many questions have been uh, asked yet over 190, which is great. You can still ask more questions. And as I said, you can uh, give them a like if you want uh, the first. Well, there is one question with 130 likes. Um, and uh, this is fantastic. So um, uh, we will see then which questions we will hear put to Professor yeah. Eden Höfer. Jutta, thank you very much, Micha. You have already mentioned many things, and I would like to go back to what you said at the beginning, Professor Oedenhofer. You said uh, the, 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 the price is very important, and the history of CO2 pricing shows that it can only be effective and it happens on markets. There is already a high regulatory level, like, for example, in the European Union, because otherwise, as we've seen time and again in Canada or uh, in other countries, that the price is either too low and is not effective or too high and uh, will then be abolished quickly because people fear that the economy um, is disadvantaged uh, by it. You said that we need further elements, and I would like to ask you again, which role do you think could play my favorite uh, issue, the German uh, energies, uh, um, Renewable Energies uh, Act? Uh, we got things cheaply because we have this technology-specific uh, support. 
and only thus, uh, by uh, with the support, we could introduce these carbon prices, which we need to become climate neutral. Only thanks to this technology support, we could do it in Germany. And I'm uh, quite convinced that without without the support, we would not have been able to make it politically um, acceptable and to have enough innovation. And then a second thing I was wondering during your presentation, maybe you can ex um, you can expand a little bit on this. Uh, you showed that in various sectors, uh, uh, avoidance costs are different. If we have a uniform uh, carbon price, which we apply uh, an example, uh, like for uh, coal or um, um, sea shipping traffic, uh, we will uh, push uh, coal out of the market, but we might have uh, supply problems while uh, ships continue uh, because for them uh, 70 euros per ton is not very expensive. Uh, that's uh, just the difference bet between uh, whether you uh, buy a bunker fuel in the morning or in the evening. So they don't have this incentive, which we want to, to um, create thanks to uh, CO2 pricing. So for them, we may need other instruments. And I think you could uh, think of quotas or maybe a cap for emissions. But without that, I believe uh, we will not reach our objectives. What do you think? Uh, how can carbon pricing uh, be effective in a sector which is so price unelastic? Um, and when it comes to uh, ships, um, people say we need a global carbon price. Well, to be honest, um, I don't see it that way. Uh, I cannot imagine that, at least not in the next 15 to 20 years. So these carbon leakages, which uh, are mentioned uh, time and time again, uh, even though according to what the European Court of Auditor is, says, uh, it's not a topic at the moment, uh, even after emissions trading. So um, how do we answer these fears, uh, carbon leakage? Um, uh, because we have to find these answers. Otherwise, it's very difficult um, to find a fair uh, carbon price. So uh, Jutta asked uh, lots of questions and I'll just pass them on to you uh, before we can uh, take up the questions uh, we got in the chat. But I'd like to ask another question which you could maybe answer. We have rising coal and, and um, gas prices, as you've also um, explained. Uh, so the conservatives uh, say we should stop climate policy uh, so that pri those prices go down. We answer no, obviously, we don't want that. Uh, we want a long-term policy. But could you maybe explain why uh, we have these rising gas and coal prices at the moment so that we kind of have the whole picture? And then uh, you could maybe answer the questions Jutta asked, uh, and then later we can look at the chat and answer those questions. Well, rising gas uh, prices, uh, they uh, are uh, dependent on the time in which we are living now after Corona. Um, the business cycle has an upward trend, uh, the economy grows as to re the renewables production went down a little. We have uh, these transitional phenomenons also in Asia, higher gas demand, uh, problems with Russia perhaps. Uh, so uh, there were different elements which compounded each other. And uh, additionally, um, gas prices uh, rose faster than coal prices, uh, even outside Europe, uh, um, uh, then coal came back. And outside of Europe, we have no compensating CO2 pricing. So the risk of a coal renaissance is very real for us uh, outside of Europe, but not inside the European emissions trading system. Uh, so uh, via rising CO2 prices, this renaissance of coal will not happen. That's just a very transitional effect, I believe. This was the first question. Well, the debate on uh, CO2 pricing and other uh, via versus other instruments. This is a never ending debate, I have to say. And um, I'd like to say the following on this. I think we should distinguish 
uh, between various things. T carbon price can be supplemented uh, through instruments uh, of uh, technology, uh, politics, and when there is a learning effect, for example, then uh, you, you can um, fund such technologies, support them. But Ms. Paulus, what you said that the carbon price uh, has no effect in the sectors you mentioned, well, I do not agree with this. Um, I would deny that. I would uh, rather say uh, that uh, after the phase out uh, from nuclear energy in Germany, we uh, saw that we could support the renewables, uh, which was a good thing. But if back then uh, we had had a CO2 price, uh, we did not have had to buy 10 new coal uh, power plants in Germany. Uh, we had energy systems with more renewables, could have used gas transitionally. And the, in the electricity sector, we uh, would have seen emission reductions more tremendously and faster. Uh, so carbon price, well, people say uh, mm, carbon price is not effective here and there. Um, some people believe that it's not important, but I think uh, it should be the guiding instruments. That's what we should begin with, and then we can see what we can supplement it with. Uh, there are different possibilities. You can have your opinion on that, and then you can uh, steer things. And if you want to reach something, you need initial financing and support for pilot projects. I think that's uh, indispensable. But it's also important to emphasize that these two instruments have to be combined. If you don't combine them, then uh, you go into the wrong direction. And the other, the other instruments, well, they can be um, adjusted uh, later. And as to the question you put to me, I think that's the really important point. We are accustomed to saying that we have a certain level uh, of the CO2 price, which is politically accepted. And if it goes beyond that, the risk is that it, uh, the, the CO2 price will be abolished. And the investors know that too. That's why they say we don't need this high carbon price. Um, we wait with our investments and uh, don't put the alternatives to the market. And then there are two possibilities. First, you... Um, um, uh, set up a further support uh, instruments for these investments, or we just uh, keep uh, firing uh, hydrogen or other things where the margin avoidance costs are high. You mentioned the different uh, avoidance costs. I think that's a typical example uh, for a static view as opposed to a dynamic view. If you look at it uh, statically, you are right. If you see the problem statically, then when there are different uh, margin avoidance costs uh, in the sector, which today has uh, low avoidance costs, uh, you will do a lot in other sectors, um, not a lot. But if you announce the CO2 prices, and I know that it will rise in the course of the next 10 years, because say in Europe, uh, we have adopted uh, such uh, decisions uh, a cap uh, in ETS, uh, uh, the emission ceiling goes down, and uh, this means that we have you have to reckon with long-term CO2 prices. And if you look at it this way, things look very different. If you expect that CO2 prices go up, then uh, the sectors you mentioned have also an inset an incentive to invest into avoidance strategies because they will they know that sooner or later they will be hit as well. And then they will also start to invest. And that's why I believe that a static uh, view uh, in climate policy is not helpful. I think you are certainly right. Uh, we have been thinking statically for a long time. And this led us to think that other instruments, technology standards are very, very important. But if we now have these ambitious goals as uh, greenhouse gas neutrality, then I think two things are important. We have to have stable expectations. Uh, carbon pricing will have will, will have to play a more dominant role than it played in the past, but the other instruments, they have to be complements and the CO2 price has to be supplemented by other instruments and not the other way around. And then carbon leakage, well, I don't think that this is a core problem of uh, CO2 pricing. 
uh, this could the same could be said for other regulatory regulatory uh, instruments uh, because uh, the costs uh, don't go away through these instruments they are just uh, distributed differently and this um, brings me to my last point if we want to avoid uh, carbon leakage uh, we will have to see that uh, we um, enter into a competition with the other main emitters and uh, the question was also who pays for it in the end. And I think uh, there is a huge uh, difference. Uh, and the uh, economists uh, can publicly uh, hardly say that uh, there are different burdens, uh, paying burdens and other burdens. When it comes to technology standards, um, the car companies uh, have to um, carry the burden first, but then they hand it on to the consumers. So in the end, it's the consumers who carry these burdens. And that's why I think that uh, in the end, it's very important to realize that we want to socially acceptable climate policy. We will need compensation schemes, a direct uh, refund or tax measures uh, socially it is not imposable, it is not acceptable if um, under the bottom line, uh, those who have high incomes, uh, sorry, so those who have low incomes have a proportionally higher uh, burden. So I would like to uh, start with a more practical question. Oliver Steigmann uh, calculates here and says, uh, low-income homeowners, what about them? If you have to have conversion of your heating, you have to have insulation for your house, uh, windows have to be renovated, doors, uh, 80 is 130,000 euros will this cost, uh, according to his calculations, such insulation for your home. So the question is, uh, if you have a high carbon price, um, how... Uh, can it help uh, um, poor homeowners uh, also when you think of a climate dividend? So that's a very practical question. Then another question, what about the influence of energy um, stock markets and energy markets? Uh, is this influence positive? What's the influence on energy prices according to you? And uh, a further question, a broader question, uh, shouldn't we rather have uh, pricing for all environmental goods, not only for greenhouse gases? Shouldn't we introduce something like that? And um, then there are more questions on uh, if the interpreter understood it right, nuclear energy. Um, but a last question I would like to, answer, to, to ask uh, here, uh, companies like RWA say uh, uh, take up insurance um, against higher CO2 prices uh, by 2030. They hedge, so to speak. How can you avoid this? That uh, for these large producers, uh, by doing this, uh, the high CO2 prices will not have any effect. Mr. Edenhofer has to switch his mic on. Well, these are very difficult questions. I'm going to start with the question whether this should not uh, be done for all external effects. Um, this is about uh, traffic jams, noise, local air pollution. The answer is yes, you should. But if you're looking at uh, the debate about the CO2 price, that's already very complex complex. So it would be very courageous to um, tackle the other external um, effects as well. Um, there have been studies about this. I think in theory it should be done, but I think CO2 uh, prices are maybe the most important among these, but uh, we will in the future need a more uh, comprehensive energy tax reform. Also, um, in terms of CO2 prices, this will then uh, generate revenue uh, for the Ministry of Finance and how can that be compensated? These are very uh, important issues. 
which uh, will have to be dealt with uh, in, the, in the next uh, coalition period and the next government. And then um, the electricity market directive, does it, or liberalization of electricity, will it help or uh, hinder? Well, I think it could help if it's done well, because of renewable energies, we have a, uh, an opportunity to actually get market conditions on the electricity market, finally. And of course, there's always um, uh, this argument against that uh, for the market uh, for renewables to say um, the marginal costs are zero because uh, there are no costs. So how would you account for um, overheads for fixed costs? I think um, storage technology will here be the uh, key question, power to X, uh, hydrogen, green gas, and these storage technologies, that's going to be a bit the, the business uh, model. So if electricity prices can fluctuate and storage um, technologies will be the business model, then renewables can be offered under uh, normal uh, liberal market conditions. I think it could be a help. And I don't really understand why so many liberals have taken uh, this long to uh, recognize the significance of uh, renewables and renewable electricity markets. And now on to the third question with this um, example calculation, how much for renovating a home and how could the CO2 price help? help? I think it's a typical problem. So. Of course, it's difficult in the very beginning because it's going to uh, generate pressure on uh, some people. And for the renovation, you're going to have to help in the beginning. It's not that I uh, believe that. You just have to be very strict, just CO2 prices, no other measures in the purest way. But uh, at the M. Uh, CP, we have uh, made some calculations what it would mean for uh, a couple and no children and for poorer households. And so there is this uh, CO2 calculator to give you these um, uh, figures. But at the end of the year, it would amount to a few hundred euros, depending on the, the level of the CO2 price. So if it's a renovation and the owner of a home cannot afford it, then uh, at the end of the day, they are going to need help, I, I would agree. But uh, one thing is important here, it's just uh, then uh, going to be very difficult when you uh, introduce new policies as a shock, very uh, sudden. So in all models where an introduction um, is very sudden and with not uh, when it's not uh, announced uh, a long period before, that's when you have social upheaval. Were there other questions that I may have uh, forgotten now? Um, yes, there was this uh, question about uh, major companies buying CO2 uh, certificates up now to hedge against higher CO2 prices in the future, so it would uh, not have any effect on them in the future, or they're even given these certificates freely. The, that they've been given uh, the certificates um, uh, freely, that, that's not okay. Um, they should be um, optioned. But, um, and these hedging strategies, um, well, it's not quite clear if they're really doing it. I'd say without having um, uh, any detailed knowledge um, of this, that it is a temporary phenomenon. And uh, you mentioned it before, a price of 70 euros. That's what we have in the moment. And per ton uh, CO2, that's definitely be uh, amount to a, quite a lot of pressure on a uh, lignite uh, um, fire plants. So I'm not too worried, even at the current price level, this is going to have an effect on uh, the owner of such power plants. Three uh, very interesting questions I found here from the audience that I would like to ask you. And then we only ha we have 264 five other questions that are still open. You can still vote for questions. We have another 20 minutes, so please keep voting for questions that you like. I really like the first question, Matthias Hanauer. 
why not to give the citizens uh, leverage for a CO2 uh, emissions lowering by making emissions trading open to all citizens, opening it up for, to all citizens. Then second question, going in the opposite direction, let's say. Wolfgang Bengtsson asks, uh, internalize external uh, costs. So that means uh, the environment is um, considered a good that's being traded uh, at our liberal market, and um, we really have to lower our um, expectations um, and make sure that uh, the polluter or the, uh, the, those who cause damages are paying. And how can we achieve this? And the third question that I thought was interesting, when we're, while we're phasing out coal, how can we prevent uh, focusing on gas too much? Because it is also uh, problematic with the methane uh, chains, etc. So how can we make sure that we're going from coal directly to renewables and not uh, to gas first? These are very interesting questions. Thank you. I'll start. Uh, opening up emissions trading uh, to all citizens. I'm assuming that uh, you're thinking of the following system, that every citizen would have an emissions budget per capita and everyone can trade. I think, uh, sorry to interrupt, I think it's more about uh, uh, looking at current uh, the current ETS. We have a few institutional players, but why isn't it like a currency that's open to everyone? I'm not really sure about what it means, but um, what's meant. But let's say an open uh, emissions trading system, um, that would mean that citizens would have the certificates, not the companies. And so where do you start? Where uh, coal, oil, and gas are entering the economic cycle or at the level of the consumer? My preference would be to uh, start where they're entering uh, into the economic cycle because you then uh, cover all the sectors, the so-called upstream system. So once you have this upstream system and you have the emissions trading system, why uh, isn't it possible for everyone to trade and buy uh, emission certificates and take them out of the market? These are uh, thoughts, um, some, some argue that, but if people buy certificates without using them, that would mean undermining political decisions and, uh, and, and tightening the chain. So who would fix the cap? Those who buy certificates up and then uh, take them out of the commission? Or is it the commission? So these are interesting questions. And I would say uh, where the fixing of the cap and uh, emissions reduction, that probably is a political decision. And that's why it's mm, difficult when you have a major citizens initiatives buying up certificates. Um, but uh, in principle, the, these compensator systems exist and they're actually very good because when you're trying to compensate a flight state, it would be better to buy a certificate and take it out of uh, take it off the market <clears throat> than um, buying some trees somewhere, planting the trees. And then uh, and the environment as a good <clears throat> internalizing external effects, so you're saying it's uh, not okay to uh, consider the environment uh, like another tradable good. Uh, Let me briefly explain why I do not share this view that this uh, would make the environment just another good, uh, goods, another type of goods to be traded. We still have a limited amount of, we have a limited amount of CO2 that can be emitted. So we're actually limiting the use of the atmosphere and we're limiting the use of soil. So it's not making everything free to be traded with everyone. It's the opposite. Uh, by by uh, means of emissions trading, you're having a, a clear limit saying you can't emit more than that. 
within these limits, you um, you trigger processes to make sure that the avoidance of emissions is as cost effective as possible. Or if you're trying to avoid land use or prevent land use, that doesn't make bio biodiversity a tradable good on the uh, capital markets. You're just saying land use for industrial purposes is limited. You're making the good of um, available areas scarce. And that's an incentive, incentive to use the available land in a more effective way. So <clears throat> to make these um, natural limitations more visible, um, I would say it makes a lot of sense. It's not about uh, considering uh, our environment as just another type of goods that can be uh, bought and sold. And I don't think that that's the point of the polluter pays principle and then lifestyle, um, lowering our expectations and our lifestyle. That's of course something that we could discuss, but um, at a first level, we need to uh, find a global uh, agreement for very fundamental environmental um, um, aspects and goods in order to make sure that we can prevent climate change and also for biodiversity to make sure that large areas worldwide are left uh, for biodiversity or fostering biodiversity. And that means that the rest of the uh, land has to be used more effectively. So then next question, how can we prevent uh, building um, larger gas infrastructures now uh, to replace coal? Well, we, I believe that we are going to need gas as a bridge technology, yes, but because by means of emissions trading, we have to make it clear that by 2050 in Europe, we want to have a net zero emissions. And that means that gas cannot be more than that, more than a bridge technology only. So we're not going to need not, not just blue hydrogen, but green hydrogen. And if we're needing green hydrogen, that means it is going to be in order to um, generate synthetic fuels. So this is the long term goal and it has to be dependable for investors that this is what we're really trying to achieve. It would be a catastrophe if we said now we want a uh, greenhouse gas neutrality, but in a few years, 10 years, the government says it's too much work and um, actually we're, uh, we're going to let go of this cap and everyone who had invested in green hydrogen would have lost that investment. And that is a very serious question. So credibility, um, um, also in terms of our democracy, how can our democracies cope with such long-term policies and long-term questions? I don't really have a good answer to that. I, um, I'm kind of, uh, thinking about the uh, topic of the possibility of a uh, European uh, climate uh, institute. Um, but I really, uh, that's an interesting question, how to cope with such long term questions. And uh, I'm really interested in a discussion about this because it's something that I think about a lot. That's very interesting. Um, I'm going to take over from Micha because we um, want to share the facilitation. So I have another three questions. One question that was um, asked twice, actually. So it's, I'll start with it. And why is it that the service sector is more affected um, by higher CO2 prices? It's not directly clear because <clears throat> it's not particularly a high uh, energy intensity uh, intensive. Then the second question. It's not really a CO2 price question, but still interesting for this webinar, I think. What do you think about uh, several electricity price zones in Germany so that the transport costs um, are really are going to be paid um, where they are um, uh, generated? And how, what does the Green Party think about it? So. <clears throat> That would mean that wind uh, power, which is more in the north of Germany, would um, have a stronger effect in the north. That's really the question behind that. And then <clears throat> emissions trading, should it also be a limit? Meaning that 
uh, we're never going to emit less than we have in <clears throat> emissions trading. It's the waterbed effect that uh, renewables have not reduced the amount of certificates available. We have partially <clears throat> improved on that because certificates can now be uh, taken off when coal power, uh, coal fired power plants are um, taken out of commission. But of course, at the moment, it's like that. Um, if you have a, a certain amount of certificates, uh, it means that this will be emitted as amount of CO2. <clears throat> Start with the service sector question. That was a model by a colleague. Of course, energy uh, intensive sectors will uh, have a higher burden, but because they have this higher burden, they will pass the prices on to the service sector. And because of that, <clears throat> because costs will be passed on to the downstream uh, steps, these are indirect effects uh, have to be taken into account and they can be significant and uh, especially in uh, terms of these questions you have to really analyze these indirect effects very carefully i don't exactly know how uh, the model worked it was just uh, an example, but it's plausible, I think, because you're looking at the costs passed on to downstream um, industries or sectors by energy intensive sectors, and that means that <clears throat> um, and this means that the service sector will be affected. And then the question about uh, electricity price zones. It's an interesting question. As an economist, um, I would say that would um, increase efficiency, but as so often in real life um, and in politics, that's difficult because it's about equality um, of um, living conditions in the regions. That's a very difficult questions. <clears throat> And uh, it's not something that uh, can be um, uh, implemented at the moment, I think. So in order to have uh, equality of distribution, uh, you sometimes have to have some losses in uh, efficiency. Uh, basically, it's a good idea, but it's not feasible at the moment. It's political, not feasible. Then the third question, uh, emissions trading upper limit and the water bed effect. Well, yes, there is an upper limit. You can't emit more than um, you have in terms of certificates. But if you're looking at, <clears throat> let's say a member state uh, wanting to do more and have an additional, uh, have additional measures, then emissions trading will actually make it more difficult because let's say a member state <clears throat> decommissions a coal-fired power plant and uh, introduces more renewables that would lower prices <clears throat> in the emissions trading system and somebody else will emit more by being able to buy more certificates and that's frustrating but if somebody wants to do more then the consequence of course will be that they have to watch other people emit what they originally would have emitted, what they're saving, other people will emit. Uh, Axel Ockenfels has done an experiment on that, and it clearly shows that this type of effect will lead to the following situation. Voluntary additional efforts will be undermined by uh, this type of uh, emissions trading system. So this intrinsic uh, motivation from individual uh, will be undermined. So the question is, how can you deal with that? And uh, I think that's the function of the minimum price in the ETS. So if we had a minimum price, then um, we wouldn't have this water benefit. So these voluntary additional measures would actually lead to the lowering of emissions emitted. That's not the same as in a tax and fiscal politics, because uh, you wouldn't actually lower the price uh, by additional measures um, in this um, 
scenario, but we can't introduce a tax in Europe. And the disadvantage, as we said earlier, uh, would also be that uh, you'd, uh, because of the um, fluctuation of fuel prices, you'd always have to adjust the tax rate. So I think that uh, introducing a minimum price is a, a good compromise here. I'm scrolling through the questions and uh, there is one question I find uh, very exciting. Uh, what are the chances that emissions in agriculture um, receive also an effective uh, upper limit? And then another question, where is it? Here it is. Uh, can we um, reach 100% renewables in a market economy? Is that really necessary? Don't we also need public policy for that? Well, the question is not very specific. It's too unspecific, I would say. I think we have to get rid of these dichotomies. Uh, regulatory policies, bans, uh, soft policy recommendations. Where have they been effective in the past? And uh, where have they been uh, successful? Um, uh, CFCs, for example, um, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, uh, they were banned. Uh, then there was a substitute uh, uh, product. Uh, and this has solved basically our ozone problem. The question is, isn't it? Why can it be that uh, in the transformation process uh, against the greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions, we have difficulties with bans? I think this is because when it comes to bans, we have to always look at indirect effects, which we cannot always really calculate. Because when it comes to prices, well, they are good indicators to see where uh, CO2 intensity is highest and where um, uh, reductions can be highest. Uh, how high is the CO2 intensity of a banana you buy in the super supermarket? It's very, very difficult to calculate that. You need complex life cycle analysis for this. But if you say, uh, I have a CO2 price in the economic cycle, at the beginning of the economic cycle, uh, then you have all these effects already included. Uh, then you just need two indicators in the supermarket. Um, then, then you don't need the two uh, indicators, price and uh, CO2 intensity, but one indicator is enough. And that's the advantage because uh, with these prices, we get this information, this information to find out where it is um, the most cost effective uh, to avoid emissions. Bans are difficult because they would only function if there weren't uncertainties. If the regulators had all informations um, about everything, uh, then you can re could really um, um, assess all these alternatives and uh, can see which would be uh, the result in the alternatives. But that's not the world we live in. And therefore, uh, I would advocate not against uh, regulatory measures, uh, but what I say is that we should give prices a more important role, because in the next decade, uh, we ha have to be ambitious in climate policy and the old uh, regulatory paradigm, which was relatively successful in the past, we would not have the same uh, success story in the future. That uh, would be my petition, my plea when it comes to regulatory policy. Great, uh, we are reaching uh, slowly but surely the end of our meeting. That's uh, why I would now hand over to Sven, uh, who uh, said uh, he would answer the questions on uh, nuclear power and taxonomy. Uh, in the Q&A tool, we had interesting questions. For example, why don't we manage uh, uh, to uh, um, use the renewables uh, instead of nuclear power, considering that uh, nuclear power costs, uh, not uh, thinking about liability questions. Um, sun and wind uh, can only dream of such prices. Um, and uh, nevertheless, uh, nuclear power stations are built. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much uh, for all the insights you shared with us.
uh, we uh, have uh, very rarely uh, such a uh, high caliber guest as you. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Sven, for the organization. And thanks for everybody who participated here. I think a few questions remained open, obviously. And even after the meeting, we won't be able to answer each and every question. But we will have a look at the Q&As. And uh, we'll also take them up in our daily work. Michael is uh, responsible for emissions trading. Um, I'm responsible for the emissions directive. Um, and for both sectors, the questions, uh, what we can do about uh, energy pricing is an important one. And now for the final word, I'd like to pass the word to Sven. Three minutes I heard you will have. Well, we're not in the German delegation of the European Parliament here. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to say very briefly as to the questions uh, uh, that were um, directed uh, at us, uh, taxonomy, um, sustainable investments in the uh, EU in order to um, promote uh, the transformation of uh, the energy market. Well, against the original plan of the Commission, uh, the plan is now to classify uh, nuclear investments as sustainable and unfortunately also uh, gas investments without strict rules. They should also be, con they, they will also be considered as sustainable. So the, these plan plans do exist and uh, if we're unlucky, uh, the Commission will publish them on December 1st. The way I see it, this would mean that Europe would become ridiculous because then you could uh, green uh, financial products uh, call green products, even though uh, greenhouse um, uh, damaging um, emissions or nuclear um, emissions are financed by it. Uh, so the legal framework does not really permit this um, taxonomy. Um, and later on, you will be able to fight against it, but the damage will be done. I think it's important that the new German uh, government will talk quickly to France and that uh, we will get the time necessary for it from the European Commission. This dedicated um, legal act uh, on which we discuss uh, must not be presented on December 1st. No, the Commission has to give us an opportunity to find agreement with France. And it could be that the French standard for sustainable um, standard uh, excludes uh, nuclear and gas, uh, whereas uh, France asks uh, that uh, the German standard allows both. On the other hand, uh, France uh, will uh, go their own way according to the European treaties. It's not uh, a European competence to decide whether France builds nuclear power stations or not. In so far, we have to respect it. We can only um, wish uh, the, the French Greens uh, a lot of success, who, like most of the French citizens, means that that would be the wrong way. But that's a French decision. On the other hand, uh, we should not allow France um, uh, to have a European, to foster a European uh, norm uh, via a European legal act uh, in a way. Uh, that means that afterwards, uh, green financial products in Europe will just be ridiculous. This is the task before us. And I believe that uh, there are possibilities to get an agreement with France. What we could wish for is that uh, the beginning of uh, the new German government uh, in Germany will be um, a, um, a new way to the Green Deal, more democracy, more European uh, ability to act. Uh, it cannot be in the French interest that a new Chancellor Scholz, that when he goes to France to say hi to Macron, as it is the habit, that uh, then uh, we will uh, that the newspapers write about the nuclear controversy in Europe. No, what the, the newspapers sh should write after such a meeting is new Europe European unity and stability. So that's what we um, require from the European Commission uh, time that we can use for the said um, 
discussions with friends. Mr. Edenhofer, thank you very much. Uh, you showed that the uh, Jesuit uh, education um, uh, brings about clarity in the mind. That was really interesting for me. Many of the thoughts uh, you voiced uh, have convinced me uh, a free asset, uh, which is free and uh, has no price, cannot be limited. Uh, we will not manage that. Uh, and we will not manage that, that uh, certainly um, with a good democratic um, means. Therefore, um, pricing is efficient and is also protecting our freedom, because it does not mean that we will uh, tell people how they have to live. It means freedom and responsibility for the people. And uh, this does not mean uh, that we have an instrument in which we turn something into a commodity. No, it's uh, as you said it. We do it on the basis of a democratic decision and uh, determine uh, how high uh, the emission amount can be. And this leads to a market instrument. And that's quite different from uh, something which has been given uh, to everybody for free and turn that into a merchandise. No, it's a democratic uh, limitation decision, if you wa want. It's not a commodification of something which we have received for free, the atmosphere, the planet. But I nevertheless believe that there are dimensions uh, which have to uh, be uh, also seen in the analysis. Uh, behavioral economics uh, tell us that uh, the reason for consumption is not personal happiness, but um, um, as from a certain level, it's the comparison with others, which means I want to have something because somebody else has it too. And the CO2 price would mean that people who have lower incomes, even if uh, I uh, have a compensation for this, will be more under pressure uh, to adapt their uh, life uh, form um, to uh, the climate norms, uh, whereas uh, other people um, are freer in this respect. Uh, um, but people who earn less have to um, uh, do most for the adaptation necessary. And uh, in my eyes, in my mind, this uh, means that we have a dimension of inequality. And in uh, capitalism, uh, we distribute uh, many uh, scarce resources, also money. And therefore, it's not logical that we distribute everything according to money, but um, scarce uh, atmosphere, not. You could say that the atmosphere belongs to everybody in the same degree. It has not been brought about uh, by work, and therefore such distribution mechanisms are questionable. And here I would uh, argue that uh, we have good reasons why a CO2 price uh, has to be combined with uh, absolute consumption limits in certain areas. I believe uh, the policy would be sympathetic, uh, which says, um, uh, this is something which the Friday said, uh, my eldest son says this always, there is no right uh, uh, to an SUV. My son is nine years old and he's absolutely right. Uh, SUVs, well, a right to SUVs, maybe for those who work in the forest, to have a horse in a horse van, they have to, to, to trail. Uh, I think it's good uh, that uh, where you can uh, have limits by uh, maintaining freedom, also through regulations in order to limit uh, consumption. This is a good thing in the areas where it's possible. It's not possible in all areas, but where it's possible, we should de do it. Why not uh, a um, speed limit in Germany? We are not going to get it because of the FDP, but the majority of citizens would agree to it. And then uh, why should we have short haul flights uh, uh, for uh, distances where we could easily take the train and would be uh, quite as fast. So there are good reasons for um, while maintaining uh, freedom, uh, we could uh, limit uh, status consumption and that could be combined well with the price regime. And another argument I'd like to voice, a price regime 
uh, fits perfectly uh, to societies in which uh, social inequality is not too uh, big. Because when it's too big, we still have the problem um, of uh, feeling uh, injustice uh, because of these uh, different um, adaptation pressures. That's why we should all become Scandinavians. I don't know uh, whether you, the, the professor uh, who um, was your doctor father would have liked it, but if you want to have efficient pricing system, it's very important that you uh, have not too much social injustice. And that's why for us Greens, it's a good idea to combine market instruments with a policy, with a policy for, for a fairness and justice, and this uh, counts uh, in all countries. So, Micha, good intelligent pricing system, that's what we have to bring about. I hope that soon we will have a German government which uh, supports such instruments and uh, does not stand in their way. And we all have to see to it that we get an energy policy uh, which really uh, brings us on this path. And I say it a little bit pathetically, I hope that tomorrow we have a coalition contract on which we can vote as Greens, the first red-green coalition, as to the Renewables uh, Energies uh, Act uh, helped uh, to make renewable energies cheap. That was a huge achievement, a huge contribution from Germany. The next red-green red coalition, and this for, uh, uh, time um, with uh, uh, the FDP, the Liberals, will have to see to it that for the first time, a large industrial country brings about a truly uh, renewable energy system. That's the next uh, big step we have to achieve. And if we achieve it, uh, nuclear energy will not be competitive anymore because already as to the system's cost, if you calculate it annually, um, it is more expensive than a renewable system. But that's the big task. We don't have uh, time. We have to start right now. Thank you very much, Mr. Edenhofer, for participating. Uh, all the best uh, to all of you, and I wish uh, us uh, tomorrow an exciting day. I hope that tomorrow it's going to happen. All the best. Uh, continue with Europe calling over 3,000 uh, registrations we had. We will see later on how many locked in. Uh, thank you very much, much uh, Micha, Jutta. See you next time. Bye-bye. And thanks the, to the interpreters.